Well, praise the Lord, Missouri Camp. What an honor it is to be with you for this second night of our youth camp. For all of our junior high students, all of our high school students, I honor you and your commitment to the things of God. And again, while I lament that we cannot be together, I thank you for your response last night. I could feel your response while I was preaching. I was sweating. I was giving it everything I had to preach conviction to you, preaching about choosing righteousness, and I believe you made that choice. And I want to preach to you on this second night what I really feel. I'm I'm feeling this message about the power of Pentecost, and I want to preach to you about this thought tonight, the power of dramatic conversion, the power of having a dramatic conversion. And so I'm going to be turning your attention to Acts, the 10th chapter. While you're turning to Acts chapter 10, you ought to just shout real loud and just magnify the Lord. Maybe shout loud enough that somebody in the room next to you, uh, they they can hear you, maybe even scare somebody a little bit. The power of a dramatic conversion. It is in Acts chapter 10 that we read one of the most powerful Pentecostal experiences in all of Scripture. It is a portion of Scripture where Peter has gone as the preacher and is preaching to Cornelius and his household. Verse 44, words that any pastor or preacher would love to experience. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. Isn't that powerful? And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. That means the Jewish believers that were with Peter, they were astonished. As many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of Of the Holy Ghost. How did they know? The Bible says in verse 46 For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? Here's why they have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of. Of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Again, I am preaching about the power of a dramatic conversion. I was privileged, I can now say, to spend my teenage years in a small central Illinois town. It was a small central Illinois corn town. I'll never forget the time that. Visitors had come from southern Illinois, and as a gift, they had brought sweet corn in the vehicle. They were somewhat embarrassed when they pulled up to our house because they did not realize that we were literally surrounded by fields of sweet corn and beans. But it was delicious nonetheless. But this small town that I lived in had a population of just over 2,000 people. Now, to most of you, that's a very small town. To some of you, that is very much at home. Now, to those that have lived in a small town like this, you know that in a town of this size, it's easy for everybody to know everybody else's business. Well, let me say it this way. If someone had a new truck, pretty much everybody knew within a couple of days. If someone passed away, almost everyone knew within a couple of days. Well, my teenage years, I was able not to get a new truck or a new car, which is a fun story in and of itself, but I, I did being able to move to this new city and trying to make friends. I made friends with a couple of teenagers there, and what they loved to do was ride 
bikes. Now, some of you watching this, you've already graduated from riding bikes, and, and maybe you, you, you don't care about that anymore. But I remember that, to me, my gateway to friendship, it seemed like, during that small season in those early teenage years, was to get a bike. But I didn't want just any bike. They liked really cool bikes. Now, I'm going to date myself by talking about this, but, but it was BMX bikes and, and, and Dino was the brand. Dino, that's exactly right. Now, somebody that's around my age and demographic that, that liked to ride bikes nearly 30 years ago, whatever it would have been, 20, yeah, nearly 30 years ago, you can maybe remember this famous company called Dino, and I remember convincing my parents that I needed a bike, and I had begun to brag to those couple of friends I was making, I I'm getting a good bike, it's going to be awesome, my, 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 my parents are going to get me a bike too, and again, here I am in this little town surrounded by cornfields and bean fields, and we didn't have anything to do, there was no big downtown, there was nowhere to go, but there were bikes to ride, and I didn't have a bike, where I moved from, that wasn't really a thing, and I'll, I'll never never forget the day that my, my parents took me to town, which was about 15, 20 minutes north, and they, they took me into this bike, bike shop. And now, now being a parent myself, I, I understand, man, what a monumental moment it really was and, and, and what a sacrifice it was even for my parents to take me to this bike shop and get me this bike. I walked in, and I'll never forget, I saw the, the walls were, 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 were all covered in frames of bikes, and it was one of those high-end places where you'd choose frames, and you'd choose wheels, and, and you'd put the colors together. I, I, it, wasn't, it wasn't like shopping at Walmart. My parents really wanted me to make friends, and they, I think, were trying to really make me feel better about our move to this new corn town. And I'll never forget when I spotted it, it was over there, there was a little rise that went up into the back of the shop, and it was setting on that, on that rise. It was a neon frame, neon yellow. It was the brightest bike in the whole place. It had dino in letters across the, and across the frame, and there were mags that were setting mag tires. For those of you that don't know about mag tires, mag tires were sweet. They were these thick, like rubber plastic rims inside, and they, and they said, G GT on that. That's what it was. It was a GT Dino, the years that, that the GT and Dino had come together in the companies. And I'll never forget when they started putting those tires. It was, it was like the greatest day of all my early teenage years when my parents bought me that GT Dino bike. It was the neon yellow and it had those GT wheels on it and, and I sat on it in the store and I, it was hard to believe that I was actually getting to, to take that thing out and we put it in the truck and brought it home and and the friends in town they could not believe it man when I when I rode up next to them because you know how it is amongst kids sometimes we we say oh, I'm getting a new bike but it doesn't ever happen I actually got the bike never forget it I loved that bike. I would wipe it down. I'd make sure that it was clean. I'd ride it with my friends in our little town of 2000 where we'd be jumping dirt piles and, and riding down, owning the sidewalks and crossing the railroad tracks. Man, it was the coolest bike in town. And listen, just like a new truck, everybody in town knew that that neon yellow bike was mine. Well, we... We took a trip one weekend. My bike was nestled in the garage, same place I put it every single day. I parked it there, made sure it was clean, made sure the kickstand was setting properly. I didn't want anything to hit it. We set off on a trip where we actually went was to southern Illinois to visit our grandparents. And we were there for a long weekend. And when we came back three or four days later, I'll never forget my excitement. I ran into the garage because I had been separated from my bike for a handful of days, you know, three or four days. And I went in. And when I went in and opened the garage door, you already know where I'm going. I opened and And for some reason, it wasn't there. And, and I kind of treated it like some of us guys treat the refrigerator when we open and there's nothing in there we shut the door and we open it again believing that miraculously ice cream will be there this time or something we want to eat will actually be there I, I shut the door of the garage and I opened it again believing maybe it will appear but alas to my dismay I opened the garage door and the bike was gone 
I looked around. I looked, maybe somebody moved it. Maybe my parents, maybe they didn't want it to get hit. And I, I began to turn. My garage wasn't that big. It was a basic two-car garage. And there was no bike. It's hard to miss a neon yellow bike with the coolest mag rims that anybody in this corn town has ever seen. But it did not take long for somebody who had noticed we returned home. Remember, it's a small town and everybody kind of knew and there came a knock on the door. And one of my buddies that I always rode my bike with, he had the puzzling question for me. Hey, did you give Kyle your bike? The devil is a liar. No, I did not give Kyle my bike. My bike is missing. There was a boy there in town. And I look back now in adulthood and I recognize that he was probably a little bit less well off than I was. Maybe he didn't have as much and I wasn't well off, but maybe he just had less. And find myself trying to be an advocate now and excuse him. But I don't know why other than he wanted what I had. He recognized I was out of town. He went in my garage and took my bike. Let me say it right. He stole my bike. I don't know if you've ever had anything stolen from you. But man, it, it, it'll set you off. It'll, it'll bother you bad. But here's the kicker. He didn't just steal my bike. He rode it all over town. I'll never forget that young man telling me the story. He said, I've watched him riding your bike all over town for days. I wish everybody, every teenager, every young adult, I wish you could have been with me when I went and I knocked on his door. And I said, Kyle, I know you stole my bike. I'm going to call the cops if it's not back by tomorrow morning. And I just turned and left. And Kyle was a lot bigger than me, but I had a little righteous indignation. You'll never believe it, but the next morning, as sure as the sun came up, when I went to my garage and opened the door, there was my neon yellow GT Dino bike sitting in its spot. I went and inspected it, made sure nothing was wrong. There were no new scratches, no new dents on it. It was returned to me. I am here all these years later recognizing what happened. He was jealous about what I had. Now let me flip the switch on every apostolic and every individual that is Pentecostal watching this and ask you this question. Don't you believe that people should look longingly at what we have in the Spirit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't you believe the same way Kyle, when I was a kid, was jealous about the bike? Don't you think that people that come in contact with us, there ought to be something about them that looks at us and wants what we have in the Spirit? I'm going to preach to you about that right now, that I believe we have the greatest thing that the world is ever going to see or ever going to experience, and that is the power of Pentecost. Woo! The power of Pentecost is for everybody that wants it. It is for everybody that believes in it. It was at the power of Pentecost, that great celebration where the fasting of the days before would end, where the fasting of the preparation would end, and there would be a celebration to be embarked upon by every single person person that desired it. It would be the all flesh appetite of, of, of celebration that would be experienced. It would not be just for leaders. It would not be just for those of a hierarchy, but it would even be for the maid servants. It would even be for the bond servants. It would be for the stranger that was found along the way. So I got good news for everybody that's watching this right now. Whether you've been in church for 50 years or whether this this is the first message of a Pentecostal preacher you've ever heard. You are supposed to experience the power of 
Pentecost. That's right. You are meant to experience the power of Pentecost. And the power of Pentecost is simply this. It is the Holy Ghost. It is the demonstration and power of God's Spirit. It is the Holy Ghost. That's right. I'm going to say it over and over again. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you're going to know it just like they knew it in the book of Acts, the second chapter. Jesus had told them that there was power coming in Acts 1. And in verse 8, he said, after that, ye shall receive power power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you're going to be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You know what he was saying? Like Kyle wanted my bike. Everybody everywhere is not only going to need but they're going to want what you've got and you're going to have the power of the witness unto them because what I am going to give to the church is bigger than for one G graphic location. That's why while I hate that we're separated physically and we're having to experience this digitally the power of the Holy Ghost is bigger than just a destination or a location. The power of the Holy Ghost is a spiritual power and it will reach right through the camera and it will reach right into your living room or right into your church and it will touch you where you're at. Oh you You've got to do is want the power of the Holy Ghost and it will come upon you. And in fact, in Acts the second chapter, we know that 120 were left. Many had gathered, but 120 were still there in what the Bible called that upper room. Gathered there in the city. They were in an upper room praying. They were isolated from the crowd. They were alone. It's good news for you to be solitude today it's okay that you're separated maybe with just a small group the bulk of the crowd that day was not in the upper room either but they were there gathered in and they were tuned in and they were praying and as they were praying you know it Acts chapter 2 says suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them then Peter goes out and begins to preach to the masses because they started spilling out into the street and they were speaking and all the people that were dwelling there devout men from every nation and they said aren't all these that are speaking Galileans how then hear we them in our own language they knew that something was different some people thought they were drunk but others knew they were not and Peter stood up and said these men are not drunk as ye suppose being intoxicated would not make them magnify God in your native language it would not make them magnify God in your native tongue but this is that which was prophesied by Joel in the last days saith God I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh I'm going to tell you right now, you better look up because we are in the last days. And although we've been separated by the pandemic, there are people receiving the Holy Ghost all over the face of the globe right now. Because while we have been physically distanced and what they have tried to call social distance, people are tuning into the Spirit of God. And they're looking back to the pages of Scripture. And they are being reminded every prophet promise in the book is mine every promise from God is mine and that's what's happening here in the book of Acts Peter said Job prophesied it he was directly in line with the great writer that said for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man but holy 
men of God spake as moved by the Holy Ghost. I'm going to, let me pause here a little bit and tell you what started happening in the crowd that day is what was happening in Kyle when he watched me riding on that bike. People around that room started saying, I don't think it's fair that only 120 got it. I, I don't think it's right that only 120. And Peter said, no, you're exactly right. Everybody that wants it, everybody that wants it can have it. Here's what you've got to do. In Acts 2.38, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he went on and told them, for the promise is unto you and unto your children and all that are afar off. Woo! It means it's to you. It's to your uncle. It's to your mama. It's to your brother. It's to your sister. All that are afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And it went from 120 in an upper room to 3,000 souls that single day being added. I'm telling you, it was powerful and it was dramatic. But I've got news for you. The same experience of Acts chapter 2 is the experience that God has for you. Whether you're in your church or whether you're in your home. Whether you're downstairs in your basement or whether you're in the middle of your living room. If you want the Holy Ghost and the power of God, if you will seek Him, He will fill you. Woo! I wish you'd throw your hands towards heaven right now and somebody call on the name of Jesus and say, I want the Holy Ghost. Yes, I'm preaching to those of you that already got the Holy Ghost too. I'm preaching to those of you that have got filled a long time ago. You got to stir up the gift inside of you. And remember, although I've been in a pandemic, I need to talk in tongues all over this bedroom. I need to talk in tongues all over. Come on, if you only do your dancing at church, then you're dancing for the building. If you only do your shouting when you're in the youth group service, then you're shouting for them and not him. But if you believe in the power of God and the power of the Holy Ghost you ought to worship him for the infilling praise God yeah 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 you ought to lift your voice come on lift it loud enough scare somebody close but the amazing nature of Acts chapter 2 could not last for there would be persecution there would be persecution hit the church It is my firm belief persecution had to hit the church so that there would be enough reason for them to leave having good church. And if this pandemic has taught us something, it's that we cannot be satisfied with just having good church. We cannot be satisfied with just having good church in our buildings. Whether it was persecution for them and it's been pestilence for us, but it's reminded us the power of the Holy Ghost is bigger than the building. I know we've been saying but we've been reminded the power of the Holy Ghost is bigger than the building and we get to watch it play out in Acts chapter 10 please hear me in Acts chapter 10 I gotta I gotta hurry here but in Acts chapter 10 there is a devout man named Cornelius he's a long way from the upper room he's a long way from the right last name for he himself and his household they were not Jewish Christians they were not of the chosen people among the beginning those who the Jews believed were really meant to have the promise. They were more in the dog category, old Cornelius and his house. They were those who were isolated by last name. They were those who were isolated by lineage. They didn't have the right upbringing. They didn't have the historical backing. Their chronological order of their family line and their family tree seemed as though it should have excluded them. But here's what Cornelius was. He was a praying man. Ah, hear that right now. Cornelius was a praying man. He No, he didn't have the right lineage, but he had the right God, and he was a praying man. 
and he was seeking God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10 when you begin to read about him, he was a devout man and one that feared God, which means that he actually was among the Gentile Christians who had already begun to convert. He had already tried to begin to live like a Christian even though he was a Gentile. He was already sowing in financially. He was trying to give his money into what he believed. He was having power of what he believed. He was feeling the edges of the experience, but he knew that there was more. I'm preaching to many right now that you have felt the fringes of his presence, but you know there's more. You have felt the outside experience, but you know there's more. You've tried to disqualify yourself by your last name or by the home that you live in or the fact that you're the only one in your house that lives for God or that nobody taught this to you when you were a child. Some of you have tried to dismiss it because your grandma never told you this was right. But when you get a mind after the things of God, you put all of that behind you. You put you just reckless abandonment like Kyle jumping on that bike. I, I don't care who sees me. I want it. I want it. While his motives were wrong, I understand what he was after. He had something desiring in him. And I'm preaching to the individual that'll hear me right now. I'm preaching to the person that'll say, I don't care who sees me. I want more of God. I don't care who makes fun of me as long as God hears me. I want everything. I don't want a little blessing. I don't want a small part. I want everything that God has for me. But notice this. While Cornelius was praying, Peter in another area also began to pray. Peter, this Jewish Christian, this great preacher of Pentecost, it had been a while since he had walked out of the upper room and stood in front of the mass audience that day. It had been a while before he gathered at the feast of Pentecost and preached one of the great starting revivals that would begin to launch and be the launching pad for what would later be the greatest and most expensive explosive thing that the world has ever seen. That same preacher was not preaching, but now was praying. And I am convinced that if the church that has the experience of the Holy Ghost will begin praying, this is what the pandemic has really brought. It has brought a revival of prayer to us. And I am telling you, I stand on the promises of God that whoever hungers and thirsts after righteousness will be filled. And as he began praying, all of a sudden he saw a vision as he was looking out the window. He got caught into a trance in his prayer but it was the Lord who began to give him a vision he went into a deep place in prayer and there on that sheet that began to descend he begins to see these unclean animals and the Lord is speaking to him and Peter begins in his own ideology and social custom to say I cannot eat of that that is unclean and the Lord gives him a opening revelation of what he's actually doing in the church Peter I need you to know you do not call unclean what I am calling clean I, I don't want you to call unclean what I am cleansing and so Peter begins to get a revelation that there's somebody praying and you've got to rise up and you've got to go to them I'm going to pause right here and tell you again one of the things the pandemic has helped us with is we have been praying for too long that people would come to us and and God is taking us through the power of our prayer and saying, no, I've got people praying and I'm going to send you to them. I'm going to send you to preach to them. They're devout. They're seeking me. They just don't have full truth yet. I believe there's people all over the city. I believe there's people in our neighborhoods. I believe there's people in your homes. I believe there's people right now that maybe they've been a little bit away from God, but they've been praying, and you don't know it, but they've been seeking, and you don't know it, but they've been asking, and we don't know it, but they've been pleading with God. That's what supplication really means. It means to earnestly plead with God. 
What are they pleading for? I'll tell you what they're pleading for. They're pleading for the power of Pentecost. They're pleading for the power of Pentecost. And Peter, in fact, he answers the call. Peter would not have been able to answer the call had he not been praying. The worst thing we could do during this season is think that if we could simply be in church, it would fix anything. If we really want the answer from heaven, we got to pray. If we really want the answer from heaven, we've got to pray and God will give the direction. Peter walks. He gets to the house of Cornelius. Let me hurry back to our opening text. And he begins to preach. I mean Peter begins to preach about the power of Jesus Christ to Cornelius. The family is sitting around. I'm going to tell you right now, you need to know this. The Jewish Christians were not happy about being there. They did not hear what Peter heard. They did not experience what Peter heard. That's why you got to trust whoever's been tuned into prayer and follow their lead. Peter had been tuned in and he comes to Cornelius' home and he mixes what he heard with prayer with the activation of his boldness and he begins to preach about the power of Pentecost and the power of the name Jesus and when he does, while he is speaking, the Holy Ghost fell on Cornelius and all his house. Oh, yes. While I'm preaching, I believe the Holy Ghost can fall on people right now, right there where you're gathered. I believe anybody without the Holy Ghost, it can fall on you right now. And here's how you're going to know. You're going to know the same way that the Jewish Christians knew. The Jewish Christians knew they were full of the Holy Ghost and knew they received it the same way. Because when you read right there in verse 46 of Acts chapter 10, we hear the dramatic conversion of of these Gentiles in Cornelius' home. They heard them speak with tongues. When they heard them, they heard them speaking in a language that was the same evidence of Acts chapter 2. They spoke in a language they had never cursed in. They spoke in a language they had never talked back to their mama in. They spoke a language they had never lied in. It was a dramatic conversion. Please hear that over and over again. Some of you received the Holy Ghost. I feel prompted right now. You hear me. You've received the Holy Ghost and you spoke in tongues, but the devil's tried to convince you that it wasn't real. Now hear me clearly. Tongues is not the Holy Ghost, but it is the evidence. It is the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God residing inside of you. And that is why I speak to you and tell you you need a dramatic conversion. You need need to speak in tongues as the Holy Ghost gives the utterance that spirit of God giving the utterance so that when the devil tries to lie to you and tell you it was not real that you know my my conversion was so dramatic I don't care what anybody says about me I don't even care what the devil tries to steal from me I've had a dramatic conversion here's another reason you know it was dramatic the Jewish Christians are standing around and Peter has to look at them and he says can any man forbid water he wasn't saying it in a nice way the Jewish Christians really wished that they would have had some reason because if the Gentiles are buried in, if the Gentiles are baptized in, if the Gentiles receive it just like us then it means that God is opening this promise to everyone but the same way that the physical party of Pentecost had been for everybody, God was teaching the church, the spiritual part of Pentecost is for everybody nobody could forbid water because they had received the Holy Ghost the same way and their dramatic conversion can continued forward and they were baptized in the name of the Lord. The only way anybody in scripture was ever baptized. Mark tells us he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. What is it telling us? I, I don't even need just to repent but then I've got to take the next step. I, I need to be filled with his spirit and I need to be buried with him in baptism. And so I'm preaching to you you need dramatic 
conversion. But you got to make up your mind for yourself whether you're on the on the side of Simon Peter or whether you're on the side of Cornelius. You cannot let history dictate this moment. You've got to decide I'm going to have a dramatic conversion. Come on, like Kyle wanting my bike. You got to want this more than any physical object. I'll never forget preaching in the church in northeastern Ohio. I was preaching that day about baptism. And this lady, man, I'll never forget it. She jumped up out of the crowd and she began to run down the aisle. She ran all the way down the aisle and passed me and started climbing the stairs of the baptismal. I thought, my God, have mercy. This is out of order. But I felt a little bit like Peter and Cornelius. It wasn't out of order order she was desperate and she wanted a dramatic conversion and she didn't care all of a sudden I didn't know why but the church went crazy they went ballistic watching her the pastor screamed to me said she's been scared to death of water she's been wanting to get baptized but she's been scared to death of water she climbed in that baptismal and the pastor went back there and buried her in that water of baptism by immersion all the way under in the name of Jesus Jesus Christ for the remission of her sins. You know why? She needed to tell the devil my conversion was dramatic. She needed to be able to tell the naysayers my conversion has been dramatic. She needed to be able to tell anybody that wanted to lie to her my conversion has been dramatic. So that's why I'm telling you be godly. Be apostolic. Be prayerful. But my God be filled. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. And let your conversion be dramatic right where you're at I want you to lift your hands I want you to repent of your sins if you haven't and I I want you to trust that right now when I pray the prayer of faith God is going to fill you with the Holy Ghost I don't care where you're at I want you to let the Spirit of God fill you I want you to begin to speak with tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance I don't want you to let logic keep you from it Let let your conversion be dramatic right now by the authority of the Word of God by the power of the name Jesus on the authority of your preached word and the word of faith right now fill every person that desires with the Holy Ghost and let everyone that's ever received it talk in tongues again come on if you've ever received the Holy Ghost you need to stir it up right now your house needs to be full of the Holy Ghost come on your bedroom ought to be full of the Holy Ghost filled filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, they're going to begin to play. They're going to begin to sing. I don't care what anybody does, but I want you to pray. I want you to lift your voice. I want you to pray. I want you to press like they did in Acts 2 or I want you to receive it instantly like they did in Acts 10. It doesn't matter what you do. Just press for dramatic conversion and receive the full experience of Pentecost. Jesus. That's it.